is Gloria Epstein. I uh, was a judge for 25 years, 15 years as a Superior Court judge, and 10 years as a judge of the Court of Appeal. And I now head an independent civilian review into missing person investigations. When I was a Superior Court judge, I noticed how barren the walls of the courthouse were. Law is about people, about life. It's got texture. And I thought, why don't we put some art up and just liven up the walls to reflect the work that we are doing in the courthouse? Well, I spent some more time thinking about it, thinking about how the opportunity might shape up, how there might be works of art, and public works of art in this area that represented values that were at the core of our justice system. So I went to my most trusty advisor, my husband, and he was pretty enthusiastic. From there, I called a number of people, leaders in our community, then Chief Justice, the Treasurer, and a number of other senior members of our profession, called them together and presented my idea. They were also enthusiastic, so I decided maybe this was something I could move forward with. I first had to find out who owned the property. I didn't know they know who owned the property. It turned out to be the province of Ontario. So we started from there to deal with the province and how we might have access to that land for the, the erection of the sculptures and also to get them to move forward with something that was clearly necessary on the province's part and that is to rebuild the area to renovate it because it really was a hazard, uh, both uh, an eyesore and a physical hazard. So they knew that they had to work on that area. I knew I needed them to work on that area to provide foundations for my sculptures. So the timing was perfect. For the first sculpture, there was no process. It may be obvious to you by now, not, it should be. I didn't know what I was doing. And I'd never done anything like this before. I don't think anybody had. So my next step after I knew the province was working on the property itself and had agreed to put seven foundations in as they redid the pavers, they would make seven locations stronger to support the sculptures I was contemplating. But then next, of course, came the sculptures themselves. So I had a friend who was an artist, and I asked him if he knew anybody who did outdoor sculptures. He said, sure, I know a woman in New York City. Her name is Amelia Sanders. He showed me some of her work. I thought it was wonderful. So I flew down to New York for the cold day in November, blistering snow whipping around my face, and knocked on the door, and this woman opens the door, and she's, get in, get in, it's cold out there. That was the first time I met Edwina Sanders, the artist who um, conceived it and uh, the first sculpture, the one on University Avenue called the Pillars of Justice. To add color to this part of the story, Edwina Sanders is Sir Winston Churchill's granddaughter. So I developed quite an interesting relationship with Edwina. She developed three proposals obviously um, in sketching, sketch form, sent them back to me in Toronto, and I decided, together with some of the people who were already working with me on the project, I decided on the Pillars of Justice as simply the one that was the best. And that's how the first sculpture came to be selected. It was a personal selection, which is almost embarrassing to talk about at this stage. Um, when the provincial government realized what was going on, and we were well underway to having that sculpture fabricated, they knew they had to have a public art policy, and they didn't have one. So this gave them an opportunity to develop a policy. All of the works of art following the Pillars of Justice were selected in accordance with the new provincial public art policy. got uh, some members of the Canadian art community to agree to be part of an art selection group. And then there was my board of directors that I had formed as we evolved in the 
Gardens of Justice um, structure. And so I had two groups that were going to be the final arbiters, the final people to decide which sculptures would follow the um, Pillars of Justice. Um, when we reached out to uh, get submissions for the pieces of art that would follow the Pillars of Justice, we had worldwide tender. And we identified values in our system of justice that, they, that the artists might like to try to conceptualize, make submissions, and then based on those submissions, we received a lot of wonderful ideas. Uh, the selection from those submissions, following that very extensive outreach, were made first by the art committee of renowned artists in Canada, and then finally by the board of directors, because we needed all of the pieces to be artistic and accepted by the artistic art community, and also clearly conveyed the values in the justice system that we wanted represented. So each work of art was selected on, the, on a number of bases, but the primary ones were that they had artistic value, and that they clearly communicated values in our justice system. The answer to that question curiously uh, relates to how much time it took for me to work my agreement out with the provincial government. Um, it really did take a lot of time persuade the government to refurbish the property and give me permission to use some of it for the erection of the sculptures. It took so much time, in fact, that it was just serendipitous that the um, time when I could open the Gardens of Justice and erect the first sculpture was going to coincide with then Chief Justice Roy McMurtry's 75th birthday and his official last day as Chief Justice of Ontario. So I talked to Roy and asked him if he would agree that the Gardens of Justice be the gift from the profession to him in celebration of his long and distinguished career in our justice system and as a member of the community, a leader in our community. Uh, there were other projects that had approached him on the same basis, other initiatives, and fortunately, he chose the Gardens of Justice. It was a perfect fit because Chief Justice McMurtry had contributed so much to our justice system as a lawyer, as Attorney General, and as Chief Justice of two great courts. He'd also contributed a great deal to our community in so many ways. Finally, Roy was himself, is himself, a renowned artist. When I say Roy was a real community person, what I mean is this, Roy is not a pompous man. He's not a man who just you know, buttons up and goes out to the fancy places. He is a man who mingles with um, everybody and, and, and relates to everybody. So having a place that the community could embrace, that celebrated his contribution to our justice system, and that reflected his own personal interest in art, there, there just couldn't be a better fit. So with Roy's permission, the gardens were our gift as a profession and as a community to him and all of his years of contribution and leadership. I hope they take away two things. One is, what a great country Canada is. One of the big reasons we're such a great country is our rule of law, the values enshrined in our charter, and our justice system that protects those values. How much that means to Canada as a country. And the second thing I hope people take away is the importance of celebrating, thanking, and remembering great people who make contributions to our community, both to acknowledge that contribution 
and also to inspire others to assume leadership roles and leave their mark on making Canada a better place. I'm hoping that the gardens becomes an increasingly important part of the Toronto and indeed the Canadian landscape. People hear about it, learn about it, want to visit it, and when they come to the gardens, they learn more about several things. They learn more about the possibility of a dream. They learn more about the values of our justice system as communicated by great organizations like the Ontario Justice Education Network that spends a great deal of time uh, understanding the gardens and its ability to reach out to students and educate them on a number of fronts. And also, as I said before, the um, opportunity to share Canadian values in a pretty interesting way. The power of art, if you like, is another opportunity for the gardens to um, make an increasingly uh, big contribution to who we are. Uh, because I think artistic expression is not something we talk a lot about, but through the gardens I think we can learn different ways to express our values through art. There are other ideas I've had for the gardens. I haven't yet been able to get off, the, get them off the ground, but who knows what, what else may come. I'm really hoping that we can have um, ethnic communities use the gardens as celebration areas for their annual celebratory events, whatever different community I'm talking about. That's an idea I've had for some time, and I just haven't had the opportunity to move that forward. I want to acknowledge that this isn't just about me and my vision and my dream and my tenacity. It took, as they like to say, a village to make this gardens happen. I had, as I've identified now, a core team of people. Uh, my husband has been by my side throughout all of this, but there's also a man who, whose name must be mentioned, and that is Cliff Lax, a leader in our community who believed in this project from day one and he raised every penny that went to the Gardens of Justice and made it a reality. Without Cliff, without Cliff, there would have been no gardens. But it wasn't just Seymour and Cliff and me. We were the sort of last three standing at the very end. But we had a lot of donors who came forward to support the concept of the gardens and to celebrate Roy. Once again, there would not have been a gardens without generosity of the um, and the vision really of a lot of law firms and organizations and individuals who supported the gardens of justice financially and in terms of the energy they created at the various events when we um, unveiled uh, our sculptures as the years went by as you obviously know there are beautiful fountains on the west side of the gardens just adjacent to the pillars of justice. Those fountains were originally created in the 60s. They were turned off in the 70s to save money on fuel. They remained off until about 10 years ago. And all that time, for about 30 years or 40 years, um, they accumulated garbage and dead plants and things in the space where the fountains had, were originally uh, conceived and had run for about a decade. So I thought, you can't have this garbage dump and these dormant fountains, dead fountains, sitting in the middle of this beautiful sculpture garden. So back I went to the uh, Ontario government. I think they were very sorry to have opened the door the first time. They sure didn't want to see me again. But um, I said, you have to turn the fountains back on. And I thought they could just flick a switch, turn, clean up the garbage, and turn the fountains back on. It wasn't quite that easy, because in the meantime, rats had eaten through all the wires and the pipes, and the whole thing had to be rebuilt almost from scratch. It was a multi-million dollar project, but I wasn't going away. And they knew I wasn't going away. They'd already dealt with me once before. I wasn't going away until those fountains were back on. 
So we worked at that, and on the day of Roy McMurtry's 80th birthday, we had a birthday party for him. And a whole bunch of judges and friends and lawyers all came out. And the minute we started to sing or speeches and everything, the minute we started to sing happy birthday, on cue, I had that switch pulled, and those fountains jumped back into life. And it was really such a happy day for so many of us who had stared into that garbage heap for so many decades to see that back on. And every year when I go by in the spring and they turn those fountains back on, I just have such a wonderful feeling in my heart about singing happy birthday to Roy and what a joyous occasion that was. But it was all part, you know what, it was all part about getting an idea, believing it in it and seeing it through. On the day that we um, opened the gardens and presented the very first sculpture, the Pillars of Justice, the Attorney General, Charles Harnick at the time, came up to me and he said, now I know something. And I said, what's that? He said, if I ever want to get something done that I think is impossible, I'm going to come to you, which was, of course, one of the things that I, always makes me chuckle as I go by the with the Gardens of Justice on a regular basis, but I think it's a really good message. You know, if you have an idea and you believe in it, and you push it through, the sense of satisfaction can be quite, quite wonderful. And someday I, I have a vision of sitting down in those gardens with my grandchildren and trying to communicate to them that if you have an idea and you think it's a good one, see it through.